AMU. American Military University is proud to present the following podcast. Hello and welcome to AMU Disaster Crew. I'm Glenn Koska, your host and managing editor of EDM Digest and In Homeland Security, two of American Military University's news sites. Joining me today is John Ubaldi from UbaldiReports.com. John is a retired veteran of the United States Marine Corps with three combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan to his name. He is a frequent political commentator on various news outlets, and he is the author of The New Business Brigade, Veterans' Dynamic Impact on U.S. Business, now available on Amazon. How are you, John? I'm doing pretty good, Glenn. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, and hopefully I'll stay that way, and I hope that all of our listeners and you and everybody in this fine country stay safe over the next few months and beyond, because you know what we're dealing with. There's this thing going around right now called COVID-19, and it's, I don't know if you agree with me, it's the biggest crisis that we've seen maybe since the 60s, perhaps. I don't know. I mean, it's it's up there with World War II, the Cuban Missile Crisis. World War II, Great Depression stuff. Yeah, it's up there. Yeah, lots of lots of bad things. It's up there on that list. And there's lots of talking heads that have been giving their various views on how well we've handled it. Some people think, hey, you know, it's fine. Status quo, you can do what you can do and you just get on with it and you do your best. And there, of course, there's a larger faction that is outraged about the response. And especially when it's compared to the other developed countries or Europe and Asia and such. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get right to it, John. So America is fighting this battle against COVID-19 with lockdowns and closing states and closing the economy back in the spring uh, into the uh, early summer months. How do we compare with the rest of the world? Well, it's interesting you say that. I read an article just recently um, from the BBC. And they said it's hard to quantify that one country is doing better than the other because each country has different metrics, how they fought it, how they recognized it, and how they quantify who died from coronavirus from another country. Each country is different. Like Belgium has a different way of doing it than Great Britain does, Sweden and Germany. There's no one set metrics. But for the United States, We kind of got into it in January of this year. We were kind of slow at the initial start. And then when the president got involved, he was kind of a little bit slow. But then he locked down flights coming in from China first, then from Europe. And then it just went from there. Then we had the total lockdown of the economy when it really they were trying to protect the hospitals to make sure we had all the ventilators. We had all the equipment and we had all the procedures in place because we thought the hospitals were going to be overwhelmed. So Trump had some good points. I think he was a little bit over optimistic at the beginning. That's why you saw the spike in the middle of you know May, June, July. People were tired of being locked down. So they kind of got out and that kind of spiked again. Now we're seeing the trajectory go down. Yeah, you've made some very good points already about this, especially how other countries record their statistics, but who's to say that we're correct and the rest of the world, Great Britain you mentioned, obviously there's Korea and Japan and who's right? We don't know. I guess we just have to trust it and say, okay, whatever method this country is using, it's working for them. How do we tell if it's 100% accurate? There's no way of telling. Well, there's no way, but the one thing that I would let your listeners know, each country has different a system of government. Europe has a strong parliamentary system where the national leadership kind of control things. Asia, like if you go to Taiwan and especially South Korea, South Korea did a really good job on handling the coronavirus, but they have a strong national government. It's not as strong down at the local levels. Then you go into the United States, the executive branch has certain powers, but when it comes to something like this, Most of the power is vested in the Constitution down to the state level to make some of these decisions. And each state kind of went its own direction. They took guidance from the national medical authorities, but then they also took guidance from the CDC 
And even New York took the guidance from the CDC that wasn't as accurate as they portrayed it to be. That's why they had a huge death rate in their nursing home. So you got to factor in all that. The one country that I think did pretty well and got ahead of it, and that's because of its situation, was Taiwan, because they went through the SARS epidemic in the early 2000s. So they knew something was happening in Wuhan. So they contacted the Chinese government and then they got just press releases and said, something's not right here. So when they first started getting passengers and they tested them, that's when they shut it down early. So they prevented a lot of things because they're more into the forefront because of their situation in that part of the world against China. Right. But of course, it's a tiny jurisdiction. I mean, it probably fit into Rhode Island. And that's another thing. The United States is a far larger country than South Korea, Taiwan and Europe. Well, not just that. You mentioned the different state level constitutions or uh, executive branches and such. And each state seemingly had a different way of handling it. Correct. Certain states jumped right on to the lockdown. California, I believe, was the very first one, and that was in mid-March or something like that. And then some never even had one, let me think. South Dakota was the other one. Yeah, South Dakota was in the news, and Utah, I think, never had one. And But I guess the most populous states did. But there's a lot of people that have said, well, okay, it is at the state level that all of these unprecedented pandemic measures have to be brought in at the, at the state level. And President Trump, he's the guy at the top. We're going to see him on the news conferences. But there is a lot of people that feel that the president should have, or the government should have had some sort of plan in place. I mean, it was never a matter of if a pandemic was going to hit the US. It's always a question of when, because this should have been planned for. I mean, this is just me opining here, but there should have been a big 5,000-page book that was the plan for anything like this ever hitting the U.S. And I think that's where people have a negative view of what went on and the fact that there's 50 governors and they all seem to be a bit disconnected. There was a plan. I think the problem is we had SARS, we had H1N1, I don't think they anticipated it was ever going to get to this this level where you had this massive virus that swept the world and hit every part of the United States. But perhaps they should have had. Oh, they should have. They definitely should have. But I think this is something when they do after action reports is they need to focus on what can we do at the national level? What can we do at the state level? And then the other problem is you have like dueling competing medical authorities. We have every epidemiologist and the like. Now, the one thing South Korea did that was effective is, and they have a different system of government too. It's a democracy, but they have more trust in their national government than we do here. We always look at the federal government with a wary eye, but they had trust in their their national health system to provide the right word. Here you have the CDC, you had another federal health agency. Then you have every doctor, you turn on the cable news channel and everybody was throwing stuff out. You didn't know who to believe. And then you throw in the political ramifications on that. It left people confused. And even I was confused of who's telling what. When you compare the US, of course, to countries like you've mentioned, like Taiwan and Korea and most of Europe, we don't have a parliamentary system. We don't have a social democrat kind of democracy here. We don't have um, those kind of things. So when you're in Europe or Korea or Taiwan, yeah, when the authorities tell you to do something, you do it. And I've been to a couple of jurisdictions since this outbreak occurred. And I live in New England, so I've got Massachusetts. I live in New Hampshire. I'm 20 minutes from the Massachusetts border to my south, and I'm 20 minutes from the Maine border to the east. So I go to Maine occasionally, and I go to Massachusetts a lot. And I can only talk in terms of what I do in each state. And I I visit a a lot of hockey rinks because my son plays travel hockey, and there's still practices, believe it or not. But the point is that you go to these rinks in Massachusetts, and everybody, and I mean everybody, has a face mask on. 
the coaches on the ice have a face mask on. And of course, I had to have one on all of the other parents and spectators and such. And then you go to a rink in New Hampshire, and maybe one in 10 people. And both rinks have the sign on the door which says you must wear a mask to enter this facility. I'm not putting down my home state by any means, but what I'm saying is that there is just a lack of uniformity in Correct. upholding the regulations from state to state. And that's not going to ever occur in places like the Netherlands and France and the United Kingdom and Korea, etc. So I think that was part of the problem. I would agree. Americans love their freedom. And of course, I do. We all do. We should. But this has sort of opened the book on how we just don't know quite what to do. When somebody tells you you have to stay in your house and put something on your face when you are in public, it has some deep-rooted problems for certain people. I mean, what do you think about that side of it? I would agree with you. I live here in Florida, and Florida has a large elderly population. They have followed the CDC guidelines to a point. They didn't put anybody into the nursing homes who had coronavirus and couldn't self-isolate them in a very secure area. New York did the opposite. Now, the point is, like Sweden, some people do a comparison to Sweden. Sweden did a lockdown light. They looked at who were the most vulnerable of their population, the elderly, some of the young, those who had a pre-existing condition. So they had them isolated and be careful, started to wear masks and stuff like that. But you're absolutely correct. I mean, now I have to go into any building, you got to wear a mask. But before it wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. There's no uniformity among states. And then there's no uniformity about who do you believe? Do we just strictly believe the CDC and the that national, I can't think of the agency, the National Health Agency, whatever it was called. The World Health Organization? No, it wasn't the World Health. There's a National Health okay. Organization here. I can't think of the name. Some went by the World Health Organization and they made mistakes early on in the pandemic. So who do you believe? Well, here's an interesting thing. The University of Washington they made headlines back in, I think it was March, when they came out with these projections of what might be happening by August, early August. And I remember the press conference was quite um, muted. It was, it was concerning. They had projected that there would be between 120,000 and 200,000 deaths by August 1st, if I remember correctly. And this was late March, early April that they were predicting this when the deaths at that point were maybe 20,000 or something like that. So they projected that by August 1st, we'd have between 100 and 200,000 deaths. And they got it spot on. They did. Okay. They got it not exactly right, but darn close. Well, you're never going to be absolutely right. No. But on August, I'm looking now at their website or, or a different website, which has the amount of fatalities and August 1st, 153,000 plus. So they were very accurate. Now, this same group is projecting that by December 1st, and this is a University of Washington, their current projection for December 1st is a total of 315,000 fatalities. And that's just if we go as we're going out, Correct. where maybe half the people are wearing a mask in some places. Now, the projection, if the country said, okay, we're done with all this masks business, we're going to go live our lives normally, then their projection is 363,000. And if everybody was to wear a mask, I mean everybody, then their projection for December 1st is 248,000. None of those numbers are any good. No, they're not. They're not good. Those are all terrible. They're awful, awful figures. But the point is they got it right. Will they get it right again? I mean, what do you think the fall is going to look like? That's what I don't think anybody can predict. And that goes into the election is if the coronavirus, which is on its trajectory down now, continues to stay down, that benefits Donald Trump. If the trajectory come in the cold and flu season come October, if we see another spike, that's not going to benefit the president. So and then it's all coming down to how fast we get a vaccination, how fast do we get a cure some of these other things. So I think they're close, but I don't know if that's months away. Dr. Fauci said he'll probably have a vaccine by the end of the year. 
but we'll have to see. I know they put everything on warp drive, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Well, Vladimir Putin said he's already got the vaccine and trying it out on various people. So Yeah, I can trust the Russians to come up with some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I'd want to uh, be the guinea pig, um, <laughs> no. seeing as though most vaccinations or vaccines take, what, two or three years to actually make it to the uh, population. Look at AIDS. Yeah, the HIV vaccine is still not around. No, we have medication to mitigate it so you can have a normal life, but we still mm -hmm. don't have a cure for that. No, that's true. And that's true of many illnesses. This is AMU Disaster Crew, brought to you by American Military University. My guest today is John Ubaldi. We're talking about COVID-19, and we'll be right back. Protecting the public from health challenges such as epidemics requires people with knowledge and skill who are capable of being change agents. At American Military University, you will learn the skills needed to improve today's public health in local communities and around the globe. Take the next step and apply today at amuonline.com. And we're back. Today, we're talking to John Ubaldi of Ubaldi Reports. We are discussing COVID-19 and the effect that it's having on the country, how we're dealing with it, and how that compares to the rest of the world. I don't see a viable vaccine coming in before the end of the year. I don't see that happening in the U.S. But Glenn, here's another point that you have to talk about is, if let's say they do get a vaccine, let's say tomorrow. Only 30% of the population in the United States takes the flu vaccination. We had this big issue for a number of years about when to vaccinate kids. I don't want to vaccinate my kids. Do we play that? Do we mandate that everybody take a vaccination in this country? You talk about individual liberties. I can see the hackles go up on that one. Oh, they definitely would. And there's no way that could be mandated. It would be an optional thing. And you raise a very, very good point about the flu. 30% of people... That's not good enough. It should be 100%, really. Correct. But it's never going to be 100% no, of people taking, uh, getting the flu shot. And what's going to happen, perhaps, in the fall into the winter and into 2021 is the flu season's not going to go anywhere. It's, <laughs> it's not. The bad thing about the flu is if you get the flu, you're automatically predisposed to having a really bad situation if you get COVID-19, because if you look at the stats that the CDC just released earlier this week, a uh, great deal of the fatalities in the U.S. and around the world, the people had influenza or respiratory disease or Correct. an underlying condition. And if they're having the flu in April, May, and June, then when it's not flu season and they're dying of COVID, then... When it is flu season and we get about forty to 50,000 deaths a year, a season, just from the flu. Now, when you factor in the coronavirus, I can see why the University of Washington has come up with their projection. And I hope that something changes between now and December 1st, because the idea of this thing causing over 300,000 deaths in one year, I mean, when you think about how many people died in the various wars and such, it's astronomical. It's just hard to even come to terms with. Well, if the projection is correct from the University of Washington, the United States lost 416,000 during World War II. It looks like their projection, we could be up close to that number. We're gonna exceed that number unless, I mean, this just goes through December 1st. We're not talking about January, February, and March of next year. So I hope that we don't get to half a million, but the University of Washington not only has the U.S. projections, but it has, you know, other countries. Now, the U.K., now, you got to remember, the United Kingdom, I think the population is at 65 to 70 million, something like that, and those people fit in a country the size of Oregon. And so the amount of people per square mile in the U.K. is considerably more than it is in the U.S., and yet... Correct. At the beginning, the curve went up. So by August 1st, 56,000 plus deaths, 56,000. University of Washington has them at 60,000. So an additional 4,000 from August to December 1st. So the UK either did something right or the US did something wrong or is doing something wrong. Or like you said earlier, well, different stats for different folks, right? Who knows who's right and who's wrong? 
I think there's a combination of things. I think some things the United States did right, some things they did wrong, some things they just were stumbled into it. So we're just going to have to see how this plays out. But it does play into the presidential election. Depends if he goes down, it helps the president. If it doesn't, it helps Joe Biden. I think the one positive thing that came out of it that I think most people didn't realize is one of the questions that I've, I've always asked people, or at least discuss, is we are now realizing that we had too much of our medical supply outsourced into China, like our pharmaceutical industry. 80% of all the medicines that we consume, even our generic medicine like vitamin C comes from China. Early on in this, when we had our the primary protective equipment, all was outsourced into China. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to see that, how that impacts trade. So that's starting to come back and create jobs here. So that's something I think most people didn't realize. There are reports that are surfacing from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy showing that the cases are, in fact, starting to creep up again in Europe. And we talked about Europe earlier. So what do you think is causing an uptick there? Well, some of the, thing, the reports that I've seen is almost like what caused the uptick in the United States is people were tired of being locked down. They wanted to get out. So I think that's causing the rise in some of that. So we'll have to see as the months or the weeks go on to get more data to see, is that the case? Because now we're going back to school. I'm sure they're going back to school in Europe. So they're having to face these kind of dilemmas. And I think people were just tired because you can't go anywhere. Nothing was really open. Then when they finally started, everybody wanted to get out. And me being down here in Florida, which is quite warm, People wanted to go to the beaches. Yes. And then you've got the amusement parks. I think that's some of the early signs. We'll have to see what the data shows as the weeks move on. Right. And the coming months are going to be the most important ones. Correct. To keep an eye on. Traditionally, October is the beginning of the flu season or November. And most people are encouraged to get their flu shots in October. So we'll see if there's an uptick in the percentage of people who get their flu shots because, like I said earlier, I think um, it's going to be a huge factor as to how many people are affected by COVID. And then we got to look at our vulnerable population. We got I had an elderly father before he passed away at 92, and my mom passed away at 70. So they were always getting their flu shot when the flu in season. But maybe we got to make sure we're making sure they're taken care of. Those who go into nursing homes, make sure they're taken care of. So we don't replicate what happened early on in this pandemic, where we sent people with the coronavirus in such that like in New York, sent them into the nursing home. And they said, you can self-isolate there, except you put a partition there. That's not quite self-isolating there. Right. And I think from what I know in other parts of the world, the self-isolation was very much adhered to. People were doing it. Correct. It meant staying home and not going out for anything, really. And of course, as you know, the reason for self-isolating is that you might be a carrier, you might have it, because there's only a certain percentage of people that even have even one symptom, right? There's a percentage of people who have all of the symptoms and progressively get worse. And there are people who are asymptomatic, walking around and passing on the disease. And so that's the reason why, one of the reasons why self-isolation is so important. Of course, the other one is if you do have symptoms, then it's a no-brainer. You have to stay away from everything. Well, my younger brother and his wife, he had the coronavirus and he self-isolated. He had, I think it was 10 days or 14 days. And he had a just more or less mild flu symptoms, but it affects people differently. I had another friend, she's uh, studying to be a nurse. She had the coronavirus. So it affects people differently, knowing we're going into the cold and flu season within a month or so. So we need to start planning for that. How is that going to look? Worst case scenario, if that was to happen, can the president then do what he's threatened to do before and then just sort of, this is me now, I'm taking sole responsibility for this thing. You know, I'm going to step in and I'm going to do executive order after executive order. Does he have the power to do that? He does when it comes to public safety. But public safety is a very dubious term. It's just like in our history, we had President Eisenhower, Johnson, Kennedy, and I think even George Bush Sr. used federal troops. This was obviously the riots in 1992 with President Bush Sr. 
Eisenhower, I think Kennedy, they used the troops to enforce civil rights laws down in the South, and Johnson used it for the 1967 Detroit riots. They can do that, but public safety is a very dubious thing in this highly partisan environment. This is unprecedented. So when you're talking about public safety, you're talking about either the, it's the president saying, look, it's me, I do something, or this many people are at risk, the safety of the public is at risk. That's the way he would play it? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. I think that's what he would play it. It's kind of what he's doing, kind of threatening with the riots going on across the country. So it's just the way our system works. It's great when it comes to economic issues. It's better the way our system is in Europe. But when it comes to a pandemic, sometimes our system may not be the best the way it's structured. And then we also, over the years, our institutions have been weakened through various reasons, various methods. So people don't trust our government like we once did. Like when the last pandemic, right after World War I, we still have trust in our government. After Vietnam and Watergate, the trust has dropped and it's even worse now. John, it's been a pleasure to speak to you today. I'm sure I'll have you as a guest on future podcast. But until then, thank you so much for joining us and stay safe. For more information about our university, visit us at amuonline.com. Thank you for listening. AMU, American Military University.